Hello everyone and welcome back to Let's Play Bucky O'Hare. In the last part, we rescued everyone from the prison after we finished the main four stages, and now we're in the garbage chute. This stage is dangerous, because there is a lot of instant kill hazards as usual, but they are a little hard to tell at first. Anything you see that's a little jagged, like the things I'm about to jump over right here, that is an instant kill. With that said, this is also the first stage where you're gonna have everyone at your advantage, so make sure that not only they're all powered up, but that you're used to using any of their abilities, because there's gonna be a lot of enemies moving forward that have a lot of health, and so for instance, say, Jenny's Toad Ball could be pretty good at taking them out, but you also might want to start relying maybe on... Uh, Billy's... No, Willie? I've already forgotten the kid's name, because I seldom use him. <laughs> Which is weird, because he's sort of the crux of the plot happening, considering... Uh, he's a human that got teleported to the other three, at least in the show. I forget if that's how it is in the comic book from what I looked up. This screen here is a little complicated. Uh, because it's a little bit like the lava drenched area in Red Planet. We got crushers here. And any part of the crusher that looks pointy is pointy and is instant kill. You need to kind of just worm your way between them, but the timing is a little weird. It's a lot more forgiving than, say, like, Quick Man stage in Mega Man 2. But it's still a little awkward to get around. Same with these ant lions. I don't know how you're meant to avoid them all the way through because they, they just seem like you want. They, they, it seems like they want you to take a, just a lot of unnecessary damage there. And now we suddenly got the drills from Metal Man stage in Mega Man 2. Hmm. Green ones are smaller but move slower. Purple ones are bigger but move faster. It's kind of hard to get around them without taking your time at least. Uh, if you're just trying to rush through this, you're going to take a lot of just dumb hits. Which, at the end of the day, isn't too big of a deal because this is also the end of this screen. If you have a surplus of lives like we do, that's not going to matter because that's a checkpoint right there anyway. This screen is a little unique, though, because we got these slugs here. They try to get onto your head, and when they do that, they make your jump just completely suck. So you won't be able to, say, make that jump onto that red platform I just jumped on. What you need to do if one gets on you is use that messed up jump to jump into the spikes, killing the slug, but not you. It's kind of precise, but it's not too much to worry about. What can be precise is jumping over these spikes, but you can use the geometry to kind of just stand over them a little bit, and then jump over them, no worry, because thankfully, the best part about NES and Super Nintendo game platforming is just hanging on by your pinky toe and still standing up without falling down. This screen just outright sucks, though, because uh, we got crushers here that are filled with spikes, with more spikes around them. You're likely just gonna lose some lives here, no matter what. Like, it's pretty straightforward platforming, it's just a matter of timing it correctly, but if you mess up the timing, 90% chance you're dead. The worst part of the level, though, has yet to come. Uh, cause it's this room after this. We're gonna have several rooms in a row that are, they look like sewers. And they start completely lit up, but then, uh, they start blinking dark, and you just have to kind of find your way around in the dark completely, barring the projectiles around that slowly light up the area. I hate this room because you just kind of have to feel out what's around you in a way that doesn't feel comfortable. I've said it before, I'll say it again, and I'll say it forever. As much as people hate ice levels or water levels and platformers, to me, darkness levels are always the worst because of the amount of sit and go they have, and you just have to feel things out in the way I don't like. Reduced visibility is one thing, like say if the area is just like, the area is kind of dark, but you have a good like, Mount Moon-esque shadow around you that you can still see. That's one thing, but like this, or would be one level that flashes light and dark in Ninja Gaiden 3, I think? Hate it. Blinky is your best friend here because you can get so much horizontal distance with his fully charged hover that you might just be able to reach the end of the room even if you're about to fall into water. But it's, it's, it's rough. I, ugh. I don't like it. Not one bit. And they followed these rooms up with a weird one where we're gonna have a semi-auto-scroller quicksand section, which is just really weird. This level almost feels like it's ideas they had for the game but couldn't make into full levels which is kind of weird, but oh well. Uh, with that said, I guess it's about time we finally go into the manual, because the, the manual does try to explain the game's plot a little better than the intro does. Although, it's hard to read the manual because I couldn't find any high-quality scans of it. They're all, like, 72 DPI. So, uh, if I miss say a word, it's because I can't read it for worth a damn. Also, be careful of the little... 
and eat our plants here because if you get sucked into them, they drag you into the quicksand and it's a guaranteed kill. You can stay in the quicksand for a level without dying, but if you get dragged in, you're done, kid. Although now that I think about it, we're about to reach the boss. Let's cover that before we cover the manual. This is the Toad Walker. It lands in the center of the screen and fires missiles at you. Your main goal to attack it is the little purple gem, gem on the bottom. Either use uh, Jenny's Toad Ball or aim upwards with Bucky. And I think now I meant to think about it, Willie can also uh, fire upwards. And it'll eventually duck down, fire some lasers, and jump back up and land on either the left or right third of the screen. Jenny's your best bet here because it keeps you at a safe distance, but if you want to go more out, uh, outright aggressive by being underneath it, you can. Just make sure you duck underneath it uh, when it's about to jump, if you're doing that. Plus, I don't think you can do that unless the gem's destroyed. After the gem is destroyed, though, you just need to target the toad on top, and at that point, it's just more the boss fight with a different health bar. The power of Jenny's toad ball is never to be underestimated. And with that, we're on to yet another very dangerous stage. I'd say the next stage is probably my second least favorite after the cell. This is the core, Captain. The magma is stored here. Man, I let this text stand for too long. <laughs> We've gotta blow this two-bit tanker, guys. Okay, welcome to the magma core. This stage is the only required stage that makes you use Deadeye's ability. You might notice we got a lot of platforms here with caution signs on them. You need to jump on them and get between them in order to get past the spikes. But if you use Deadeye's wall clinging, you can just kind of get between them a lot more easily. You're sort of meant to jump at weird angles, but it's just best to use Deadeye, and there's even some cases later on in this few, first few screens where it's basically required, like right here. It's a little scary because you're literally surrounded by instant death, but it's doable. Uh, if you're trying to jump with Bucky, you're in for a much worse time, I'll tell you that, but... At least you can survive. There's a couple of other annoying mechanics in this stage. I'll talk about one once on screen, but one that's really annoying is coming up in a couple rooms where there's gonna be some, like, Gravity Man-esque backgrounds to the walls where, depending on which direction the arrow is facing, you'll be pulled in that direction. It's on this screen later on in it. And you need to keep in mind your momentum when you're going through those because other time, if you're not going through at the correct speeds and letting yourself get to a certain altitude on the screen, you're just gonna get thrown into the spikes above you or below you, so be careful. All right, so in the manual, one hair-raising adventure. In the darkest part of the universe, Complex, the robotic master of all toads, gave the toad air marshal orders to kidnap as many of the crew members of the righteous indignation as they could and toss them into toad prisons throughout the toad empire as part of the overall plan to destroy Captain Bucky O'Hare. Dead Eye Duck. Jenny the Aldebaran Cat, AFC Blinky, and Earth Boy Willie DeWitt were captured by the Toads. Only Bucky O'Hare escaped via Whisker. Now he must scour the universe to rescue his comrades from the Toad Menace who has imprisoned them. Bucky knows full well that unless he acts fast, all the wart remover in Sector 37 will save his crew. Then, and only then, can Bucky go back to get back to his mission of infiltrating the Toad Magma Tank or destroy it once and for all. So buck up, load up your... I think that says laser pistols. It looks like it might say maser pistols. And let's croak some toads. Be careful in this section, by the way, because you're meant to use a full charge of Bucky's jump to jump over these toad borgs. Because uh, if you don't, you're just going to get hit. And if you try to even do some of these jumps without fully charging, or at least somewhat charging, you're just going to clip the wall and just fall into the pit anyway, so it's a little tragic. Now, like a lot of other Konami, especially, uh, manuals of the time, there's little character bios and level bios. But you know how I mentioned that the manual PDF I found is extraordinarily low quality. Yeah, I literally can't read most of them. Like, I can kind of make out the red planets. The spewing volcanoes, lava pits, and fire caves will keep you hopping. And then I literally can't read the next sentence because it's so pixelated. I'm glad there's some projects around, like Manual Project, to get, like, decent quality scans in for some games, but a lot of other manuals need to have a second go around. I appreciate that at least, I want to say by now, it's the PS2 that has a fully, like, scanned-in 4K gallery done by fans of both, like, the box art and the manuals. We need to have that happen for literally every other console now. Like, I remember morning, I think it was back during my, uh, Robo Warriors LP, like, three years ago now or something like that, that that game's manual was just not online at all, and I'm, it may have changed by now, and I hope it has. 
I know since then they, uh, get, the game got a run at a GDQ and uh, they, they ran into a soft block in the final level, which that sucked. Alright, these are some of the worst screens in the game. We got giant rotating, I guess they're meant to be like engine turbines or something. The hulls rotate into four positions. You need to figure out what position you need to be in to get into the other side of the screen. But you need to be careful because if the passage opens up into a bottomless pit, you die. And at that point, there's not really much you can do about it. Like that! This section's kind of rough, not just for that, but sometimes trying to figure out where you need to go on this little turbine to actively get to the exit isn't immediately obvious just because of the weird shape configurations each of these hallways have. This is especially, I think, the worst one here. And as matters get worse in each one, you start getting more enemies and eventually these weird little laser turrets that always fire downward. It's not... I'm not gonna call them hard, but they're definitely just weird to get around. Because it, if anything, avoiding the pit is the hardest to do in the first one, because that's such a linear pathway. After that, it's like, you, as long as you're in like the bottom left corner, you're basically universally safe. I say immediately seeing that, so maybe not, man. The point is, it's hard to figure out where you're supposed to go in each of these. And it's very easy to just kind of lose a life through that. Although I am kind of surprised how few games I see do something like this at the time. Like, we see a couple of these types of mechanics here and there nowadays. But I'm surprised, like, Mega Man never really did something like that. Especially on, like, the, the PlayStation or Saturn era. And now we got the snakes back from Blue Plant. The weird part is now they want you to use Deadeye's Charge again while also putting a lot more snakes in your way that are trying to trap you into getting just hit by the faces and instantly killed. These screens are hard. Especially if you almost accidentally fall in the pit like that, oh god! Uh, it is a little easier if you take your time, for instance, this snake is no longer a threat to doing that to you if you just wait for it to go all the way through. Uh, and thankfully you can wait, because this game's notable to me in that it's an NES platformer that doesn't have a timer for some reason. Like, there's not many of those that aren't named Mega Man. Because, uh, like, Castlevania had it, all the Mario games, barring Mario USA, had it. I don't get why the timers were such a big thing, man. It might have been, like, a carryover from our cinema arcade stuff, I guess. But that said, this is the Magma Core. We got a lot we need to target on this thing. First off, we need to destroy the cannons firing missiles at you directly. But then, once those cannons are destroyed, they start shooting lasers out of the same holes. And while those aren't instant killed, they really hurt. But, thankfully, the purple things that are being fired out of are a constant damageable hitbox, so uh, Jenny's Toad Ball away. The thing that's really rough to contend with is you need to contend with constantly respawning Toad enemies and the laser on the top left. Though, once you destroy the bottom laser firing thing, you can stand right where it is and just use that as a slight safe space. Take care of the glass tunnel in front of the main magma core and then you can just target it directly. Don't walk all the way right into the green space though, it's right next to Jenny right now, because those are technically spikes and it is an instant kill. Alright, on to the final stage we go. And, uh, I don't like this final stage much at all. Hurry up! Let's bust out of here, troops! This thing's about to blow. We're out of here, Captain. Alright, so the final stage of the game is an auto-scrolling shoot-em-up. Once you get on this ship, you're on it for the rest of the stage. Every single one of the four characters still can keep their main shot type on the ship. Uh, with the only notable exception being Bucky, actually. Because Bucky will shoot in front and behind him. I don't think you can charge your power meter here, though. Uh, if you try to, you just continuously fire like I am right now. I think. That sounds right, because I'm not seeing that increase at all. It doesn't look like it, but there are invisible checkpoints every here and there. So if you die at towards the end, you're not sent back to the beginning. But this is kind of a punishing section because there's a lot of spikes, there's enemies that try to drag you down into them, and there's a lot of places where the game will just crush you. What makes this stage especially rough, though, is that there's two boss I uh, know there's three boss fights in it. And, uh... Even though there's a checkpoint after every one, dying before one sends you back enough to be annoying. I want to say every time you see one of those caution tape uh, things, that's basically a checkpoint. Be careful in this section, those little glass barriers I'm breaking. You shoot them to break them, but if you're not quick 
about moving through them after you've broken them. The pipes close, and you're about to get crushed to death. So, uh, keep towards the middle right of the screen, as weird as that is to say for a shooter section. But yeah, it, it's weird. When Kirby does out of nowhere shooter sections, they're well developed and thought out, and almost makes sense. This game suddenly becoming this just feels kind of weird to me. At least it's by a company that's done a lot of space shooters beforehand, so it functions well, and it has plentiful checkpoints, because if great, if this was anything like some of the bad shooters where you're just sent back to the startup stage if you die, it would be rough, but I would almost prefer it if it was like closer to how Gradius 3 does it, or Gradius period now, I think about it, where when you died, you just were sent back to where you exactly were, and you just lost a life. All right, first boss of the stage, we got the Toad Drone here. It's got two arms that's trying to crush you with, and it can bounce its projectiles off of, I believe. But that's where you need to shoot first. You need to shoot straight out on the front. So you just have to stay to the far left and fire into it until they just get destroyed. Uh, when you destroy one, it starts firing more erratically. But when you've destroyed both of the arms, the head itself just starts bouncing all over the place, firing kind of unpredictably. Getting hit here is very easy to do. In fact, I often will just take some cheap shots uh, from the pellets to get some extra damage. Just be careful not to run into the toad itself because that does a lot more damage than the pellets do. This is, I'd say, the second hardest of the bosses in this stage. Uh, out of the three bosses, it goes in the difficulty span of second hardest, hardest, easiest. With that said, even the easiest is kind of a hard boss because of the circumstances surrounding it. They thankfully do give you some power-ups after every single one of the fights, though. With that, now we're immediately being thrown into the next boss fight, though. This is going to be the Toad Transport. Notice how in the top right? It's because this thing's absolutely huge. It starts off the fight by firing some Toad Soldiers up that are trying to drag you down into it. Getting dragged all the way into it is a butt instant kill, uh, but thankfully, as you can see, you can just drag the Toads into it and they can also get damaged. Then it'll rise up and start moving to the right. You want to position yourself with Blinky, though, to try and attack the little turrets that are firing at you because they can be destroyed, and you want a certain amount of them to be destroyed before you have to loop around to the front. Because once it moves all the way to the right, it stays there a second, moves down, you want to move to the left as it begins firing pellets and lasers at you. This is the main part of the ship you need to destroy. You take out the booster, the fight's over. But you're guaranteed basically to always have to do at least two cycles around the ship in order to destroy it. Because eventually it starts moving backwards and once again those turrets become a problem. You can try to take out some more at this point using Deadeye. But it's rough, and if you're not good about taking them out, you'll be trapped in this little crevice for a few seconds with all four of them firing at you, and that's just probably guaranteed to be a lot of damage right in your face. Once you get back to the front, it fires some lasers forward, dips back down, and you can try to take out more of the turrets with Bucky's shots. At that point, the fight more or less loops. I'd say the first rotation of the tow transport is the hardest part of the fight because you have more projectiles being fired at you. But it's very easy to lose track of yourself amongst how many projectiles are on screen here. So don't be surprised if you lose a lot of lives here, honestly. You especially need to be careful after you've killed it. Because when the ship is destroyed, it doesn't just explode. It does the classic, like, Zeppelin fall down while exploding thing that you see in all sorts of games. But while it's falling down... It's still an active hitbox, and can kill you. I am bringing this up for a very specific reason, in that it's happened to me several times. What makes this fight so rough to die on is how much of it you have to redo when you die. Because you have to do that first rotation over again, which sucks to begin with, but you have to let it rise back up from the ground again. There's a lot that goes on if this fight of you die, and I don't like it. Shooter bosses are kind of a hard balance to reach, depending on how the shooter itself works to begin with, though, so I'm not too surprised this is kind of clunky. Like, it's weird. Shoot 'em ups visually, at least, seem like they'd be one of the easiest types of games to get right, but there's more bad shoot 'em ups in my experience than there are good ones, and that's what I mean! The moment you kill it, get above it. But that's a jump cutting after my second defeat of that boss. And we're already pretty close to the end of the level. All we have now is the final fight, and thankfully the health restores here are a full recovery. Final boss is the Toad Marshal himself, but it's not just gonna be that easy. The left half of the screen, basically, I guess left third, 
is covered in fire because the magma core is exploding. And that's an instant kill. The Toad Marshal goes to about four or five different locations on the screen and throwing a bomb that explodes into eight bullets that fire in an arc. This is the only attack he has. I recommend being Bucky for this section because you can fire in both directions. In fact, I'm convinced this fight is the reason Bucky fires behind him. And hopefully he'll die pretty quickly. Be careful of hitting either the pellets or him because they both do a surprising amount of damage for the scale. This fight is easy, but it still can be rather dangerous, despite its simplicity. On one angle, I do appreciate this level from, like, a narrative point of view because it's honestly a really good just escape sequence visually. It's just mechanically it feels a little slopped together compared to the rest of the game, I guess is the way I want to phrase it. Like, this could have been just like a Dr. Wily machine kind of final boss, and it would have worked a lot better in my eyes. That's game, though. Let's get the hell out of here. I'm assuming we've cleared out of the fire in time. Bucky O'Hare and his bold crew disabled the Toad Mothership and escaped with their lives. The Righteous proudly flies again. The Toad Menace will not be stopped with one victory. The fight will go on. Bucky O'Hare and his crew won't rest until the Anniverse is free. Let's croak toads! And now we get our usual kind of credit sequence. Bucky O'Hare is by no means a bad game. I honestly think at least the first four levels are really solid. It's just that the difficulty curve is extreme. Between how much damage enemies do until you get a full health bar, the amount of instant kill, attacks, and hazards, this game is very hard to approach, I find. It's still better than a lot of NES games, I find, but it's just nowhere near as memorable as the games that are better than it. The main reason I remember this game is because I had it growing up because my brother at some point picked it up when he was a kid. And as a kid, I couldn't beat it. And now I have. And I'm at least glad I, say I, I can say I have, but... There's better things on the NES for you to play, I think. I do think it's neat that this cult comic that had a very short-lived cartoon got a game that's honestly, like, this high effort compared to some shovelware even on the NES. Like, you compare this to, like, any of the Simpsons games on the NES, and this is such a higher bar of quality. I can applaud it for having a lot of different mechanics going on. I like that each of the main characters has something else they can do besides just the normal run and gun. I just wish they actively were used more. Like, the most you use the powers to get is to get power-ups for the other powers. If there was, say, like, some items that temporarily boosted your defense or an attack until you died, I feel going for characters in a certain order or a preferred order would be a lot more useful. Like, it's the, it's the same thing with Mega Man, in a way, where there's a level you're going to find the easiest, and those make later levels easier in some way. But Mega Man, I feel, does a lot better with it, because it has the bosses be weak to a certain thing, or you get mobility upgrades that help you in a certain way by doing certain stages, like in Mega Man 6. There's just parts of this game that are a lot less approachable than others because of that. If there's anything I could say you're missing out on by not playing it, it's the soundtrack. There's some really good tunes in here that are just not ingrained in my memory, but haven't really left it since I was a kid. Just because I this was one of those games I constantly tried at. Uh, like, if I were to say there's another game I'm going to do as an LP at some point, just to finally beat it and get it out of my mind from when I was a kid, it's, uh, like I said earlier, like in part one, uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle on the Game Boy. Uh, if I ever get to that... I have conquered a demon from my past. As unlikely as it is, it would be kind of cool to see them eventually do a new version of this IP as a game nowadays, kind of like they tried to do with Battletoads, just do it better than they did with Battletoads. I just think that's also incredibly unlikely. Because Battletoads had like that prestige to it as a name, just because of its place on the NES. I don't think Bucky O'Hare has that power quite, just because of how cult it is. Mind you, uh, the kind of cool thing about cult fan bases 
is that it only grows, so maybe someday that could happen. I really doubt it, though. If you want to play the game, though, you're kind of out of luck when it comes to uh, most ways to play it, because both this and the arcade game, to my knowledge, never got any ports or virtual console releases or anything, I think. Let me check if it's on NES Online. Uh, no, uh, given that that brought up only emulation sites, yeah, you're, you're kind of out of sight, out of luck when it comes to playing this on any kind of real hardware without probably shelling out some money. Like, you know what? I'm curious. I don't usually like to check this, but what's it looking like on eBay? Brand new 2700? Jesus Christ. What about not new? A 370. That lunchbox is 50 bucks. Hmm. I think you're shelling out some money and if you want to play this legitimately. Yikes. Not the highest numbers I've seen for something like this, but it's, uh, it's kind of up there. Maybe check your retro stores? But with that, I'm going to need to end this off here. Thank you guys for watching. Have a great night, take care, and I'll see you guys next Let's Play, whatever that may be. See you guys then.